Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dear Coleman, I discovered the uh, one thing not cured by a vegan diet, jet lag, but uh, I will do my best. Allow me to begin on a personal note. This is a, a picture of me taken around the time that my grandmother was diagnosed with end-stage heart disease and sent home to die. She already had so many bypass surgeries, you basically run out of plumbing, get all scarred up inside, confined in a wheelchair, crushing chest pain. Her life was over at age 65. But then she heard about this guy, Nathan Pritikin, one of our early lifestyle medicine pioneers. And what happened next is detailed in Pritikin's biography. My grandma was one of the death's door people, Frances Greger. My grandmother arrived in a wheelchair. Mrs. Greger had heart disease, angina, clot occasion. Her condition so bad, she could no longer walk without great pain in her chest and legs. However, within three weeks, she was not only out of a wheelchair, she was walking 10 miles a day. This is a picture of my grandma at her grandson's wedding, 15 years after doctors had abandoned her to die. She was given her medical death sentence at age 65, thanks to a healthy diet, was able to live another 31 years on this planet till age 96, along with her six grandkids, including me. That's why I went into medicine. Years later, Dr. Dean Ornish published his landmark lifestyle heart trial proving with quantitative angiography that we could indeed reverse heart disease, opening up arteries without drugs, without surgery, just a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors. I assumed this was going to be the game changer. I mean, my family had seen it with their own eyes, but here it was, published in black and white in some of the leading medical journals on the planet, like JAMA and The Lancet. However, nothing happened. I said, wait a second. If effectively the cure to our number one killer in the States, heart disease, could effectively be lost down some rabbit hole and ignored, what else might there be in the medical literature that could help my patients but just didn't have a corporate budget driving its promotion? Well, I made it my life's mission to find out. For those of you unfamiliar with my work, every year I read through every issue of every English language nutrition journal in the world so busy folks like you don't have to. Then I compile all the most interesting, most groundbreaking, the most practical findings to new videos and articles I upload every day to my nonprofit site, nutritionfacts.org. Everything on the website is free. There are no ads, no corporate sponsorships, strictly non-commercial, not selling anything. Just put it up as a public service, as a labor of love. New videos and articles every day on the latest in evidence-based nutrition. What a concept. Okay, so where did Pritikin get his evidence from? Well, a network of missionary hospitals set up throughout Sub-Saharan Africa uncovered what be, may be one of the most significant medical advances of the previous century, according to um, uh, pioneer Dr. Dennis Burkett, that many of the most common and major diseases were universally rare, like heart disease. In the African population of Uganda, for example, coronary heart disease was almost non-existent. You say, wait a second, 
almost non-existent, what were they eating? Well, they were eating lots of vegetables and grains and greens, and their protein almost exclusively from plant sources. And they had the cholesterol levels to prove it, very similar to what one might see in modern day plant eaters. You say, wait a second, maybe the Africans just died early, never lived long enough to get heart disease. No, here's age-matched heart attack rates in Uganda versus St. Louis, Missouri. Out of 632 autopsies in Uganda, only one myocardial infarction. Out of 632 age and gender matched um, um, autopsies done in the States, um, there were 136 myocardial infarctions, more than 100 times the rate of our leading killer. They were so blown away, they did another 800 autopsies in Uganda, still just that one small healed infarct, meaning it wasn't even the cause of death. One out of 1,427 patients, less than one in a thousand, whereas here in the Western world, in Germany, heart disease is an epidemic. Here's a list of diseases commonly found here and in places that eat and live, like Western Europe, but were rare or even non-existent in places that centered their diets around whole plant foods. These are among our most common diseases, like obesity, for example. Hiatal hernia, one of the most common stomach problems. Varicose veins and hemorrhoids, two of the most common venous problems. Colorectal cancer, leading cancer killer. Diverticulosis, probably the most common disease of the intestines. Appendicitis, number one cause of emergency abdominal surgery. Gallbladder disease, number one cause of non-emergency abdominal surgery. As well as ischemic heart disease, the commonest cause of death in the States. Um, a leading killer here. Yet a rarity among plant-based populations. Now this suggests that heart disease may be a choice. Like cavities. If you look at the teeth of people who lived 10,000 years before the invention of the toothbrush, pretty much no cavities. Didn't brush a day in their lives, no flossing, yet no cavities. Why? Because candy bars hadn't been invented yet. Right? So why do people continue to get cavities when we know they're preventable through diet? Well, easy because the pleasure people derive from dessert may outweigh the cost and discomfort of the dentist chair. And look, that's fine. Right? If you're an adult, uh, you, know, and, uh, you know, think the benefits outweigh the risk for you and your family. You know, uh, if you understand the consequences for your actions, what more as a physician can I do? Right? So if you think that the benefits outweigh the risk, well then go for it. I certainly enjoy the occasional indulgence. I've got a good dental plan. Right? But what if instead of the plaque on our teeth, we're talking about the plaque building up inside of our arteries, another disease that can be prevented through dietary changes? Then, what are the consequences for you and your family? Now we're not talking about scraping tartar anymore. Now we're talking about life and death. It's still up to each of us to make our own decisions as to what to eat and how to live, but we should make these choices consciously, educating ourselves about the predictable consequences of our actions. Atherosclerosis, heart of the arteries, is a disease that begins in childhood. By age 10, most kids raised on the standard American diet already have what are called fatty streaks. First stages of the disease, um, and then um, the, uh, um, these plaques start forming in our 20s, get worse in our 30s, and then can start killing us off. In our heart, in our heart is called a heart attack, and our brain, a similar disease, is called a stroke. So if there is anyone here today, older than age 10, <laughs> then the question is not whether or not to eat healthy to prevent heart disease, it's whether you, your patients, your future patients, 
want to reverse the heart disease that you already have. Is that even possible? When researchers took people with heart disease, put them on the kind of diet followed by populations that did not get heart disease, their hope was to just slow the disease down, maybe even stop it. But instead, something miraculous happened. The disease started to reverse, to get better. As soon as people stopped eating artery-clogging diets, their bodies were able to start dissolving some of that plaque away, opening up arteries without drugs, without surgery, suggesting their bodies wanted to be healthy all along, but just were not given the chance. This dramatic increase in blood flow on the left was after just three weeks eating healthy. Let me share with you what's been called the best kept secret in all of medicine. Best kept secret in medicine is that sometimes under the right conditions, the body can heal itself. You know, if you, uh, you know, whack your, <laughs> if you, if you whack your shin really hard on a coffee table, it can get all red, hot, painful, swollen, inflamed, but will heal naturally if you just stand back and let your body's natural healing processes work its magic. Right? But what if you kept whacking your shin in the same place day after day? Right? It never heals. In fact, three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Right? It would never heal. You go to your doctor and be like, oh, my shin really hurts your doctor. Be like, no problem. Whip out their pad, write you a prescription for painkillers. You're still whacking your shin three times a day. Oh, it still really hurts, but it feels so much better with those pain pills on board. Thank heavens for modern medicine. You know, it's like nitroglycerin. Um, people take nitroglycerin for crushing chest pain. Tremendous relief, but you're not doing anything to treat the actual underlying cause. Right? Our body wants to come back to health if we let it, but if we keep re-damaging ourselves three times a day, we may never heal. It's like smoking, for example. One of the most amazing things I learned in all my medical training was that within about 15 years of stopping smoking, your lung cancer risk approaches that of a lifelong non-smoker. Isn't that amazing? Your, your lungs can like clear out all that tar and eventually it's almost as if you never started smoking at all. And every morning of our smoking life, that healing process starts until wham, our first cigarette of the day re-injuring our lungs with every puff, just like we can re-injure our arteries with every bite, when all we had to do all along, the miracle cure is to just stop re-injuring ourselves, get out of the way, stand back, let our body's natural healing processes bring us back towards health. Sure, you can choose moderation and hit yourself with a smaller hammer, But why beat yourself up at all? The human body is a healing machine. This is nothing new. We've known about this for decades. American Heart Journal, 1977. Cases like Mr. FW here. Um, angina so bad, couldn't even make it to the mailbox. Started eating healthy. A few months later, he was climbing mountains, no pain. Now, there are new classes of anti-angina drugs on the market now. They cost thousands of dollars a year, but at the highest dose, may be able to extend exercise duration as long as 33 and a half seconds. It does not look like those choosing the drug route are going to be climbing mountains anytime soon. Right? See, a plant-based diet's not only safer, not only cheaper, but can work better 
because we're treating the underlying cause of the disease. Now, according to the WHO, heart disease is not the leading killer in Germany. It is killer number two. Killer number one of Germans is cancer. What happens if you put cancer on a plant-based diet? Well, Dr. Dean Ornish and colleagues were able to show a reversal of the progression of early stage prostate cancer with a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle interventions, and no wonder. If you take blood of people eating the standard American diet, drip that blood onto human cancer cells growing in a Petri dish, you can suppress cancer growth by about 9%. This is on the standard American diet. But if you take people um, who have been eating a plant-based diet for a year and you drip that, their blood onto those same types of cancer cells, you can suppress growth um, nearly eight times better. The blood circulating within the bodies of eating plant-based diets appears to have nearly eight times the stopping power when it comes to suppressing cancer cell growth. Now, this was for men and prostate cancer. They wanted to repeat this study using women and breast cancer, but look, they didn't want to wait a whole year to get the results. Right? Women are dying now, number one um, cancer killer specific to women. So they said, let's see what a plant-based diet can do after just two weeks um, after um, eating a plant-based diet against three different lines of human breast cancer. Um, this is the before cancer cell growth rate powering away at 100%. This is after eating healthy for two weeks. So this is a representative photomicrograph, a photograph taken under a microscope. What they did is they laid down a confluent layer of, uh, of breast cancer, like a carpet of breast cancer. Then they dripped the blood of women eating the standard American diet onto that cancer. And you can see it kind of breaks up that cancer into these kind of cancer continents here. But then what if you take these same women, put them on a plant-based diet, and then retest them two weeks later. So they act as their own control. Same women before and after um, eating a plant-based diet for two weeks. So they laid the same carpet of cancer down in a Petri dish, dripped their blood on, and all they were left with were this. Just a few individual cancer cells remaining before and after just two weeks eating a plant-based Die. Their blood became that much more hostile to cancer. Now, suppressing cancer cell growth is nice. Getting rid of it is even better. This is what's called apoptosis, programmed cell death. Their bodies were able to kind of reprogram the cancer cells, kind of forcing them into early retirement. This is what's called tunnel imaging, measuring DNA fragmentation or cell death, where dying cancer cells show up as little white spots. For example, here. So as you can see, even women eating pretty poor diets um, can kill off a few cancer cells. But then you take these same women two weeks later, and their blood can do this. The blood circulating throughout the bodies of these women gained the power to significantly slow down and stop breast cancer growth, cell growth, after just two weeks eating healthy. What kind of blood do we want in our body? What kind of immune system? Right? Do we want blood that just kind of rolls over when new cancer cells pop up? Or do we want blood circulating to every nook and cranny in our body with the power to slow down and stop it? Right? Now, this dramatic strengthening in cancer defenses was after two weeks of a diet and exercise. They had these women walking 30 to 60 minutes a day. You say, well, wait a second, if you do two things, how do you know what role the diet plays? So researchers decided to put it to the test. So this is what we saw before. This is that same apoptosis, programmed cell death. Um, so this is the kind of, uh, this is what we saw before, people eating a plant-based diet and exercise in this study for an average of 14 years. Plant-based diet for 14 years, along with just mild exercise, like out walking every day. That's the kind of cancer cell clearance you can get. Compare that to the cancer-stopping power of your average um, sedentary uh, American. You see a little cheeseburger there. 
um, and which is practically non-existent. All right, but this middle group, that's the interesting group. This year, 14 years standard American diet, but 14 years daily, strenuous, hour-long exercise like calisthenics. They wanted to know if you exercise long enough, if you exercise hard enough, can you rival some strolling plant eaters over here? And the answer is exercise help, no question. But literally 5,000 hours in the gym with no match for a plant-based diet. This is that uh, tunnel imaging we saw before. Even if you are a couch potato, living off of fried potatoes, you're not totally defenseless. You can kill off a few cancer cells. You exercise for 5,000 hours, you can kill cancer cells left and right, but nothing appears to kick more cancer tush than a plant-based diet. We think it may be because um, uh, the, uh, the consumption of animal protein, meat, egg white, and dairy protein, increases the levels of uh, something called IGF-1 that Tim Key um, touched on in um, the last lecture, insulin-like growth factor 1, which is a cancer-promoting growth hormone involved in the acquisition and progression of malignant tumors. Um, but if you start eating a plant-based diet, you're, within weeks your IGF-1 levels go down, and if you continue eating healthy, the, um, the levels go down even farther. And your levels of IGF-1 binding protein go up. IGF-1 binding protein is like your body's emergency break. It's one of our ways our body protects itself from excess growth, from cancer. Um, uh, so sure, um, in as few as two weeks, you can drop your production of IGF-1, but wait a second. What about all the IGF-1 you had in your body from the bacon and eggs you had three weeks ago? Well, your liver releases this snatch squad of binding proteins to tie up any excess IGF-1, pull it out of the system. Your, benefit, um, um, your levels go up within weeks and benefits continue to accrue the longer you eat healthy. This is the experiment that really nailed IGF-1 as the villain. Um, uh, diet and exercise, what we saw before, cancer cell growth drops, cancer cell death shoots up. But here's the interesting column here. What if you add back to the cancer just the amount of IGF-1 you banished from your system because you started eating healthy? What happens? You effectively cancel out the diet and exercise effect. It's almost as if you never started eating healthy at all. So this may help explain why um, as we saw in the last hour, um, the incidence of all cancers combined was lower among those eating more plant-based, perhaps is because they're eating less animal protein, which means less IGF-1, which means less cancer growth. How much less cancer growth potential do we have here? Well, those um, uh, that uh, ate the most um, uh, um, protein, 75% increased risk of total mortality, fourfold risk of increased dying from cancer um, it, during middle age, but not all protein, specifically animal protein. Um, the uh, institution, the academic institution sponsoring this study, um, oh, and so, and that makes sense given the IGF-1 levels that uh, we talked about. Um, the sponsoring institution sent out a press release with a memorable opening line, that chicken wing you're eating could be as deadly as a cigarette, uh, noting that uh, a fourfold increase in cancer risk for those eating lots of meat, eggs, and dairy during middle age um, may indeed um, be kind of comparable to what one might get smoking cigarettes. So what was the response in the nutrition com uh, immunity to this revelation that diets high in mid eggs and dairy might be harmful to health of smoking. Well, one nutrition scientist says it was potentially dangerous to tell people about the results of this study. Why? Because people might think, hey, why bother quitting smoking if my ham and cheese sandwich is just as bad for me, right? So shh, let's not tell anyone about this whole meat and cheese thing. Reminds me of this famous Philip Morris cigarette ad that tried to downplay the risk by saying, you think secondhand smoke is bad, increasing the risk of lung cancer 19%. Well, hey, drinking one or two glasses of milk every day, maybe three times as bad, three times, 62% um, uh, increased risk 
of, uh, of uh, lung cancer. Or doubling your risk frequently cooking with oil or multiplying uh, or, or tripling your risk of heart disease, eating non-vegetarian, and multiplying your risk sixfold if you eat lots of meat and dairy. So, they conclude, let's keep some perspective here. The risks of secondhand smoke may be well below that of other everyday activities. So, breathe deep. That's like saying, ah, don't worry about getting stabbed because getting shot, ah, oh, so much worse. Ah, uh, how about neither? Two risks don't make a right. Of course, you'll note that Philip Morris stopped throwing dairy under the bus once they purchased Kraft Foods. Just saying. All right, next on the list of... Uh, of leading killers in Germany is stroke. Preventing strokes may be all about eating potassium-rich foods, um, uh, but unfortunately, most people don't reach the recommended minimum intake of potassium. So for example, in the States, more than 98% of Americans don't reach the recommended minimum daily intake of potassium. 98% eating potassium deficient diets because 98% of Americans don't eat enough plants. Potassium comes from the words pot, ash, take any plant, put it in a pot, reduce it to ash, you're left with pot, ash, yum, potassium, vegetable alkali. Um, but who can name me one plant food particularly high in potassium? Bananas, of course. Even, even international audiences know bananas. I, I don't know why. That's like the one thing everybody knows, wherever I speak around the world. The bananas have, Chiquita must have had a great PR firm or something. It turns out uh, bananas don't even make the top 50 sources of potassium. Coming in at number 86, right after fast food vanilla milkshakes. It goes, and then bananas. <laughs> it's funny, when I was uh, researching the new book, I went back to make sure that the USDA nutrient database, which many people use around the world, had not expanded. Um, and indeed it had. By that time, by last year, uh, poor bananas <laughs> fell to below even the top 1,000, coming in at 1,611 right after Reese's Pieces. I don't know if you know Reese's is this candy. That, anyway. Um, so the most uh, potent source is the most concentrated source of potassium, whole food source of potassium, greens, number one, beans, number two, and then dates. Bananas don't even make the top thousand. In fact, if you look at the 11th leading cause in Germany, bananas could be downright dangerous. Killer number four in Germany is high blood pressure. Uh, high blood pressure is something that um, up to 78 million Americans um, uh, have. Um, and uh, we see similar stats here where um, most people, the majority of people over age 60 in the Western world get high blood pressure. You say, wait a second. If most of us, most of us become hypertensive, in older age, maybe it's less a disease and more just an inevitable consequence of aging. That's just what happens, your blood pressures go up. No, we have known since the 1920s, for nearly a century now, that high blood pressure need not occur. Researchers went and measured the blood pressures of a thousand rural Kenyans and um, uh, their, um, and, uh, uh, this, was, they were, this was a population centering their diets around uh, grains and beans and vegetables, fruit and greens. Um, if you center your diet around there, what happens? Well, here um, in, uh, in North America and Europe, our blood pressures go up as we age. Their blood pressures go down. And the lower, the better. You know, this whole... Um, uh, 120 over 80 cutoff is really arbitrary. Um, uh, if you went to your physician, 
with a blood pressure 120 over 80, you get a gold star. But now we have data that even um, people with pressures under 120 over, over 80 appear to benefit from blood pressure reduction. So the ideal blood pressure, the no benefit from reducing it further blood pressure, 110 over 70. 110 over 70. Is it even possible to get blood pressures down to 110 over 70? It's not just possible, it's normal for those eating healthy enough diets. So, two years of this Royal Kenyan Hospital, 1,800 patients were admitted. How many cases of high blood pressure did they find? Zero. Wow. They must have had low rates of uh, heart disease. Uh, no, they had no rates of heart disease. Not a single case of atherosclerosis. Our number one killer was found. Rural China, same thing. About 110 over 70 their entire lives. 70-year-olds with the same average blood pressure as 16-year-olds. Now... Africa, Asia, vastly different diets, but what they shared in common is that they were plant-based, with meat only eaten on special occasions. Now, why do we think it's the plant-based nature of their diets that was so protective? Because in the Western world, the only folks getting it down that low on average, according to the American Heart Association, were those eating strictly plant-based diets coming in an average of about 110 over 65. The, um, this is uh, from the Adventist 2. I'm sorry I was on a plane yesterday when uh, um, uh, Dr. Fraser was talking about the Adventist 2 data, so this may be um, a review for folks. Um, but um, uh, based on 89,000 largely Californians, um, the largest study of plant-based eaters to date, comparing non-vegetarians, to uh, semi-vegetarians or so-called flexitarians eating meat more on a weekly basis than a daily basis compared to those that just eat fish, um, to those who eat no meat at all, to those who eat no meat, eggs, and dairy. You can see this kind of stepwise drop in hypertensive rates as people eat more and more plant-based. Similar things with obesity and type 2 diabetes. Um, and so what we can learn from this, yes, potentially we could throw the majority of our risk um, out the window, but I think just as important, this shows that is not all or nothing. It's not black and white. Benefits accrue, um, significant benefits accrue any step along the way, along the spectrum towards eating healthier. Now, experimentally, you can show this with blood pressure. You take vegetarians, you give them meat, what happens? Their blood pressure, when well, you pay them enough to eat it, and their blood pressures go up. Um, or you take people who eat meat, remove meat from their diet, and their blood pressures go down within seven days. And this is after most people had already stopped or greatly reduced their blood pressure medications. They had to stop their blood pressure medications because if you treat the cause of their disease, they no longer have high blood pressure. You can't be on high blood pressure pills. With no high blood pressure, you drop your pressures too low, and it can be dangerous. That's why it's so important that we as medical professionals, really, that this has to be done. If people are on medications for blood sugar control or blood pressure control, you can't, you really should do this under physician supervision. People underestimate the power of these diets to dramatically um, reverse disease, and it can be dangerous. Your blood pressure and sugars can drop too low. That's why I do this in conjunction with your physician if you're on those medications. So. Does the American Heart Association recommend a no-meat diet? No, they recommend a low-meat diet, the so-called DASH diet, um, which is the um, only diet actually officially endorsed by the U.S. government. I say, well, wait a second, why not plant-based? I mean, when the DASH diet was created, were they just not aware of this landmark research done by Harvard's Frank Sachs? Uh, no, they, they were aware the... The, uh, the, the chairperson of the design committee that came up with the DASH diet was Frank Sachs. See, the DASH diet was created with the number one goal of capturing the blood pressure lowering benefits of uh, plant-based diets, however, yet contain enough animal products to make it palatable to the general public. 
They didn't think the public could handle the truth. Now, you can see what they were thinking. Just like drugs never work unless you actually take them, diets never work unless you actually eat them. So they're like, well, look, we can't tell. I mean, no one's going to go on a strictly plant-based diet. So if we moderate the message, if we have this kind of compromise diet, well, then maybe on a population scale, we'll actually do more good. All right? Tell that to the thousand um, uh, Americans that lose a, a family member to high blood pressure every single day. Maybe it's time to start telling the public the truth. Killer number five in Germany is Alzheimer's. Now, I don't, I'm not sure of the stats here, but in the States, um, where um, it's killer number six, it wasn't even in the top 10 20 years ago. Um, of course, as you, I'm sure, Dr. Barnard told you this morning, um, uh, the latest dietary recommendation for the reduction of uh, risk of uh, Alzheimer's is number one, reduce your intake of meat, dairy, and junk, and eat more vegetables, legumes, which are beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, fruits, whole grains, and this is based in part on data going back decades now from the original Adventist study showing that those who eat meat, red meat, white meat, didn't appear to matter, um, may have between two to three times the risk of becoming demented later in life. And the longer one eats meat free, the lower one's risk may drop. Killer number six, um, a chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, COPD. Um, like emphysema, a disease that a plant-based diet can in part help prevent. We can even treat um, COPD with, um, uh, with a plant-based diet, significantly improving lung function over time. Though the tobacco industry had a, had a different view of these landmark findings, if adding plants to our diet can improve lung function, wouldn't it be easier to just add plants to cigarettes? And indeed, the addition of acai berries to cigarettes evidently has a protective effect against emphysema in smoking mice. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? Right? Next, they're going to start adding berries to meat. And indeed, I couldn't make this stuff up. The addition of extra, fruit extracts to burger patties was not without its glitches. For example, the blackberries dyed the burger patties with a distinct purplish color, which kind of turned people off a little bit. Though evidently, you can improve the tenderness of lamb carcasses if you infuse them with, uh, before rigor mortis sets in with kiwi fruit juice, you can even improve the nutritional profile of frankfurters by adding powdered grape seeds, um, though there were complaints of the grape seed particles becoming visible in the final product. And you know, if there's one thing we know about hot dog eaters is that they're picky about what goes in their food. <laughs> right? Oh, oh, pig anus? Okay, but grape seeds, ew. <laughs> Killer number seven. In Germany is type 2 diabetes, a disease that we can prevent with a plant-based diet, we can treat with a plant-based diet, and even reverse with a plant-based diet, something we've known since the 1930s. Put people on a plant-based diet, and within five years' time, a quarter of the diabetics ended off of insulin altogether. However, look, plant-based diets are, in general, comparatively low-calorie diets. Right? So maybe their diabetes got so much better just because they lost so much weight. I mean, what you'd need right, is a study, to tease this out, you need a study where you put people on a plant-based diet, but force them to eat so much food that they don't lose any weight. Um, so then you could see if a plant-based diet had unique benefits beyond just all the weight loss for diabetes. We'd have to wait a few decades, but here it is. Study subjects were weighed every day and they started losing weight, 
They were made to eat more food. In fact, so much more food, some of them had problem eating it all. They're like, oh, not another salad. Oh. But eventually they adapted. So no weight loss, despite restricting meat, eggs, dairy, and junk food. Okay, with no weight loss, was there still a benefit to diabetics for a plant-based diet? Well, insulin needs were cut about 60%, and half the diabetics ended off all their insulin altogether. Wow, even without any weight loss. How many years did this take? No, 16 days, 16 days later. So we're talking diabetics who've had diabetes for as long as 20 years, injecting 20 units of insulin a day, then 13 days later on none. Diabetes for 20 years, then 13 days later on no insulin for the condition. Diabetes for 20 years because no one told her about a plant-based diet. Here's subject 15. 32 units of insulin on the control diet, and then 18 days later on none. Lower blood sugars on 32 units less insulin. That's the power of plants. And as a bonus, their cholesterol dropped like a rock to under 150. Ooh, I don't know the units here. That's about four. Sorry about that. Um, in less than, in about two weeks, again, this is without the weight loss, which would make things even better, right? So, just like moderate changes in diet will only yield you moderate, moderate benefits for cholesterol, how moderate do you want your diabetes? Asking our diabetics to make moderate changes in diet can leave them with moderate blindness, moderate kidney failure, moderate amputation, maybe just a few toes or something. Moderation in all things is not necessarily a good thing. Moderation um, uh, may be um, truer than most people realize. Remember that uh, study that purported to show that diets high meat and dairy could be as harmful to health as smoking? Well, supposedly suggested that eating lots of meat, eggs, and dairy would leave you with four times the risk of dying from cancer or diabetes. But if you look at the actual study, you'll see that's simply not true. Those eating lots of animal protein middle-aged didn't have four times the risk of dying from diabetes. They had 73 times the risk of dying from diabetes though that's quite a confidence interval. Now those that chose moderation, eating only a moderate amount of animal protein, they just had 23 times the risk of death from diabetes. Killer number eight, it's uh, respiratory tract infections. What possible role could diet Playing respiratory infections. Well, obviously, you haven't seen my video, Kale and the Immune System, talking about the immunostimulatory effects of kale. Is there anything kale cannot do? Boosting antibody production sevenfold, but this is in a petri dish. What about in people? If you take older men and women right before getting their Pneumovax vaccination, their pneumonia vaccination, split them up into two groups, half continue to eat their regular diet, the other half, you just add a few servings of fruits and vegetables, you get a significant boost in protective antibody response. This is not cutting out meat. Just adding a few servings of produce to the daily diet can boost one's immune function. Killer number nine um, is uh, sepsis, which is, uh, which is an uh, infection in the bloodstream. Now, certainly foodborne bacteria can kind of burrow through the intestinal wall and get into your bloodstream, or in women, can creep up into their bladder. Now, we've known for decades that it's bacteria creeping up from the rectum 
um, that cause bladder infections, but only recently did we discover where this reservoir of bladder infecting E. coli was coming from, and now we know it's chicken. We now have DNA fingerprinting proof of a direct link between farm animals' meat and bladder infections in women, solid evidence that urinary tract infections can be what's called a zoonosis, an animal to human disease. So wait a second, who undercooks chicken? Right? Can't you just use a meat thermometer, right, to cook the meat till it's done, not worry about it? The problem is what's called cross-contamination. If you take 40 families, give them a frozen chicken to prepare and cook in their home as they normally would, a multitude of antibiotic-resistant E. coli jump from the chicken into the gut of the volunteer even before they eat it. So you could incinerate that chicken to ash. You don't even have to eat any of it. You're already infected before it makes it into the oven. Right? Within days, the chicken bacteria had multiplied to the point of becoming a major part of the person's gut floor. The chicken bacteria is like taken over. So wait a second, what if I use both safe cooking and handling guidelines? So for example, in the States, the USDA recommends something that no one ever does, which is you're supposed to spray bleach solutions on all common kitchen services, and you wipe it down, you wait, not anyone. But if they actually gave these instructions to people, you tell people to do this, and even then you come in later and you swab around their kitchen, and you can find significant levels of fecal bacteria, salmonella, campylobacter, serious human pathogens, for example, on some utensils, disc cloth, counter around the sink, etc. The reason that people have more bacteria from feces in their kitchen sink than on their toilet seat is because people tend to rinse chickens in the sink, not the toilet. <laughs> now, um, the good news is it's not like you eat chicken once you're colonized for life. In this study, the chicken bacteria only seemed to last about 10 days before your good bacteria could kind of muscle it out of the way. The problem is many families eat chicken more than once every 10 days, so maybe constantly reintroducing these chicken bugs into their systems. And I say, wait a second. You can't sell unsafe cars. You can't sell unsafe toys. How is it even legal to sell unsafe meat? Well, in the States, at least, they do it by blaming the consumer, as one USDA poultry market biologist said, look, raw meats are not idiot-proof. They can be mishandled, and when they are, it's like handling a hand grenade. You pull the pin, someone's going to get hurt. Now, while some may question the wisdom of selling hand grenades in supermarkets, our USDA poultry market biologists disagree, saying, no, it's the consumer that has the most responsibility, just refuses to accept it. It's like a car company saying, yeah, we installed faulty brakes, but it's your fault for not putting your kids in a seatbelt. The head of the Centers for Disease Control, Foodborne Illness, kind of the food poisoning division, famously responded to this blame the victim attitude coming from the meat industry. She asked, is it reasonable? Is it reasonable that if a consumer undercooks a hamburger, their three-year-old dies? Is that reasonable? Not to worry, the meat industry's on it, at least here in the U.S., I mean, in the States, we have uh, the, the FDA just approved this bacteria-eating virus they can spray on the meat. Um, uh, these, uh, there's concern that these so-called bacteriophages may set, present some sort of challenge to the food industry, so of course they're not going to label it or anything. But if the food industry thinks that's going to be a challenge, check out the meat industry's other bright idea. The effect of extracted housefly pupae on pork. This is a sciencey way of saying they want to smear a maggot mixture on the meat. Now, wait, it's a low cost and simple. Think about it. Right? Look, maggots thrive off of rotting flesh. However, um, they're, um, uh, they're, there have been no reports of maggots having any serious diseases. So, hey, they must be filled with some kind of antibacteria something, right? Have you ever seen a maggot sneeze? I don't think so. Um, uh, so, uh, five minutes? Really? Didn't we start a little late? I got 220. 
Uh, all right, but uh, did we start right on time, 1.30? So I'm really good. I speak 145 words a minute. Really? Okay. <laughs> we can cut it short a little bit. I would hate to, though. Where are we? Anyway. So you take some maggots, grow them three days old, wash them off, towel them off, a little Vitamix action here. Voila! Safer meat. Um, it does not look like we are going to get through the top 15 causes of death here in Germany. I apologize. However, I'm giving this talk tomorrow, and I will hopefully give it in full. I don't know. Is it tight tomorrow, too? It's as tight as today. Tomorrow, I will speak quicker. <laughs> I, think, I, I think because of the potential for language barrier, I'm speaking a little slower and enunciating a little better than I used to. And so I have to realize that. And tomorrow, you won't hear a word of what I'm saying. I apologize about that. All right, we will get as far as we possibly can. Kidney disease. Plant-based diets can be effective in both preventing and treating kidney disease, and no wonder. Kidneys are highly vascular organs, um, so uh, Harvard researchers found three significant risk factors for declining kidney function. Number one, um, animal protein. Number two, animal fat. And number three, um, cholesterol, all of which found only, of course, in animal products. Um, the animal fat can actually alter the actual structure of the human kidney um, uh, based on studies like this showing plugs of fat literally clogging up the works in autopsy kidneys. Um, this is actually a, a, a concept going back to Verkau of this uh, kind of fat nephrotoxicity um, going back centuries ago. And the animal protein can have a profound effect on normal kidney function, inducing what's called hyperfiltration, um, increasing the workload on the kidney, but not plant protein. So for example, if you have people eat uh, tuna fish, you can see a significant increase in pressure in the kidneys one, two, three hours after the meal in both non-diabetics and diabetics. Um, but what if you ate the exact same amount of protein but instead of eating a tuna fish salad sandwich, you had a tofu salad sandwich. What happens? Absolutely nothing. Your kidneys can handle plant protein without even batting an eyelash. Right? Um, uh, now, what do we think is going on? We think it's actually the inflammation caused by um, uh, animal protein intake in terms of why animal protein causes this overload reaction and not plant protein. Why do we think that? Because if you give a powerful anti-inflammatory drug along with that tuna fish, what happens? You abolish that hyperfiltration, that, that, uh, that overload uh, protein leakage response to meat ingestion. Then, of course, oh, so there's the, uh, there's the um, NSAID result. And then, of course, there's the acid load. Um, the uh, consumption of um, animal-inducing foods like meat, eggs, and cheese uh, induce the formation of acid within the kidneys. Um, this can cause what's called tubular toxicity damage to the delicate urine-making tubes within the kidneys. So animal foods tend to be acid-forming, uh, particularly fish, whereas plant foods are either neutral or actually base-forming alkaline can actually counteract some of the acid formation in our kidneys. So the key to halting the progression of kidney disease may lie in the produce aisle rather than the pharmacy. And so no surprise, plant-based diets have been used to treat kidney failure for decades now. Um, so for example, here's a protein leakage we see on what's the standard low sodium diet, what we physicians would typically put people on um, with declining kidney function switch them to a supplemented vegan diet, um, then back to conventional, plant-based. Conventional, plant-based. Switching on and off kidney dysfunction like a light switch based on what's going into their mouths. And for the next four causes of death, I will see everyone tomorrow. Thank you so much. <laughs>